Museums house all sorts of interesting specimens in their collection. You might think of an unusual bird or a remarkable mammal, but would you think of a rusty car? That's science educator and video blogger Emily Grassley, who's earned widespread acclaim for her efforts to inspire public interest in the natural sciences. Grassley's YouTube channel, The Brain Scoop, Scoop has almost half a million subscribers. Meg Oliver paid her a visit. Meg, good morning. Good morning. Emily Grassley is part comedian, part science tutor. Forbes named her as one of the 30 under 30 standouts in the field of education, and her videos have been viewed more than 24 million times. Ready to dump some stink water. Emily Grassley comes alive talking about dead things. It's like a, a UFO. She stars in her own YouTube channel, The Brain Scoop. Her warm and witty delivery turns the most unappealing topics into entertaining science lessons. I thank you so much for joining us on our first live stream dissection. The 29-year-old also holds one of the coolest job titles as Chief Curiosity Correspondent at the Chicago Field Museum. Are there any other Chief Curiosity Correspondents at museums across the country? Not that I know of. <laughs> Museum President Richard well, LaRiviere remembers right. spotting Emily for the first time. Well, it was astonishing. Uh, a young woman whom I'd never heard of just happened to blog that she was visiting the Field Museum and families took their kids out of school and a hundred of them came in here to see her. And you decided to hire her on the spot? On the spot. And you accepted the job on the spot? Oh, absolutely. I, w I was... It said, whatever you want. Many of these devil babies are made from guitar fish. Her job is to highlight the museum's scientific research on her show. You could say this legacy still has legs. She's done it all from digging up fish fossils like there? Just like that. to dissecting animals like skunks. This smells so bad. And zebras. You really love dead things. Yeah, they can teach you so much. Her unusual journey started in 2013. Grassley was an art major at the University of Montana when she visited the Zoological Museum on campus. I mean, completely overwhelmed with specimens all over from the floor to the ceiling, like taxidermy birds flying around the room. From an artist's perspective, it was a really magical place. You loved it so much, you started volunteering there. Yeah, immediately. <laughs> and then you started a blog. Yeah. That blog about cleaning bighorn sheep and stuffing and skinning roadkill caught the attention of Hank Green, one of the most popular creators on YouTube. He helped her start her own channel. Thanks for giving me my own show on YouTube. I'd never done it before, never done videos, uh, don't have a background in science, uh, and really didn't have any outside input from anybody who had worked in a museum other than the curator at the time. But you were winging it. We were totally winging it, 100% winging it. It's the biggest dog. It worked. Right off the bat, they did a five-part series on this roadkill wolf. Yes, that, that was one of the greatest moments, I think, in Brain Scoop history, um, where we were on our way driving to Fish and Wildlife to pick up this 90-pound wolf that was in their deep freezer. And James was like, you should call Liz and, and make oh, sure that sorry. she knows we're on the way. Oh, sorry. Thanks. I something called lens crafters. <laughs> she has managed to win over the scientific community with a degree of enthusiasm that I haven't seen in my 40 some odd years in academia. Scientists were so impressed they recently named a new butterfly species discovered in the Andes after her, the Wahydra grasslii. What's it like to have a bug named after you? It's one of the greatest achievements of my life, I think. <laughs> but the response hasn't always been positive. With close to half a million subscribers, she's battled a barrage of negative comments online. You have a piggy nose to you look kind of fat or things like maybe you would have more viewers if you dressed sexier. This was your version of a Me Too, kind of. It was. It really was. And I wanted to talk about it. The more I thought about it, And though, she did, devoting an entire episode to it titled, like, Where My Ladies At. I would have to say it would be the frustratingly negative and sexist comments that I have to sift through in my various inboxes on a daily basis. The media took notice. She wanted to call out the haters and show the next generation of curious students it's okay to put yourself out there. From that point onward, I saw a real shift in my community. I saw them holding themselves accountable for what they were saying. There was like low tolerance for those sorts of comments going forward.
It kind of smells like if you had like leather shoes. Some consider Grassley a feminist science icon, but she just wants to inspire the next generation. Lifelong learning is really important to what it is that we do, and it's important to me as a person, right? Um, and that's what I want people to walk away with. It's just a, a desire and a self-motivation to ask questions of the world around them. Is she a breath of fresh air? Oh, my life? gosh. I don't know if I love dead things, but I love her. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. She's outstanding. I mean, just outstanding. I Googled her, her videos uh -huh. and one word, decomposition. But she is fearless. <laughs> fearless. Fearless. She and didn't I want to talk about that. it after yeah. she first did it. Yeah. The first specimen she ever prepared. She thought there was something seriously wrong with her. Yeah. <laughs> but no, she just knows it's curiosity. Good morning, everybody. Emily makes you proud to be a part of UM, doesn't she? It's a uh, pretty, pretty amazing. A uh, feminist science icon. That is uh, an even better title than Chief Curiosity Correspondent. And uh, you know, some of you may know Meg Oliver, the reporter for that story, is also a proud UM alum from our School of Journalism. As is Hank Green, uh, one of the most watched YouTubers in the, in the world. So, you know, that story, which aired around the entire country this past weekend, is a great example of the amazing impact of UM in our graduates around the world. And I thought it was a terrific way to kick off the academic year. So I want to start today's event with some thanks. First, I want to thank our interpreters, uh, Bonnie Curian and Brandy Reinhardt. I also want to thank Jason McDaniel, our production manager, as well as Jeremy Parker, who's running the projector, and all the staff that are working behind the scenes to make today possible. I also want to acknowledge a few folks that are here. Uh, the chair of our Board of Regents, Fran Albrecht. I think Fran's here somewhere. Uh, Fran is here in her official capacity today, but she spent the rest of this week here at UM in her capacity as the mother of an incoming freshman at this university. Yeah. We're so excited to have Jane with us. So uh, I also want to recognize uh, Regent Dalton Johnson. Dalton is a student now and is also our uh, student regent for the Montana University System this year. And we're, of course, very happy to have uh, Sheila and Hal Stearns with us, our, our uh, past uh, commissioner of higher ed and our president here at the University of Montana over the past year. So welcome. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us here in person. But I also want to acknowledge those who are watching the live stream while at their desk, as well as the staff and faculty who are currently working, advising students, cutting the grass, processing payments, cooking food, doing the important work of this institution to transform lives. You know, it's often said that the mark of a great institution is in how well its people actively build toward a bright future while honoring the past. In our storied 125 years rest upon the work of many visionaries here at UM. But this place and our work also benefit from the vision and stewardship who were here long before this campus was born. And at UM, we acknowledge that we are in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish land and Kalispell people. This statement developed in collaboration with the Salish Pondere Cultural Committee reminds us that we must honor the ways through which many people shape and enrich our community. Because the fact is UM has never been the project or the result of one person or one mind. The current and future impacts of this great institution are and will be the result of our diverse and collective capacity. UM belongs to the people who lived on this land before Main Hall was built. UM belongs to Eloise Knowles, our first female graduate in 1893. UM belongs to the new freshmen who arrived on the Oval this week. UM belongs to Emily Grassley and Meg Oliver. UM belongs to the Missoula community. UM belongs to us. 
And it is in this spirit of shared stewardship and responsibility that we decided that this year's State of the University Address should reflect our collaborative efforts. So on stage with me, you see three of our shared governance leaders, Mariah Welch, Matt Semenoff, and Luke Alford, as well as our new provost, John Harbour. They represent UM at its best, and they represent UM's future. And today, we as a joint team will share with you some thoughts on where we stand as an institution, the challenges and the opportunities we face, and how we can move forward together. Because I believe even more strongly today than when I joined this great institution seven months ago, that our work here at UM is more important than it has ever been, and that this institution is well positioned to be exactly what this country needs of a university today. And while I realize that we, like all institutions, must adapt and navigate through some significant challenges, I know that we have the collective capacity to do so. So why am I so confident that we're positioned to succeed in a time of great challenge for higher education nationally? The answer is a simple equation that sits at the heart of what makes UM such a special institution. Q plus A equals T. Quality plus access equals transformation. Because our job here is not simply to provide an elite education for the select few, but rather an elite education that's accessible to people from different starting points in all walks of life. This is a critical pillar of America's long-standing social compact that promises a high-quality, affordable education for all who seek it. It's an audacious goal, worthy of our American democracy. And delivering on that compact transforms not just individual lives, but also provides the platforms for individuals to transform and sustain entire communities. And I'm incredibly proud to be a part of this work. And yes, we of course know that we in higher education face significant challenges. But when I think about these challenges, what I take away is not simply that the task ahead is hard, though certainly it is. What I take away from this is that our work is worthwhile, arguably more so than it's ever been. Because the students who showed up on the Oval this week brought with them not just their duffel bags, their new bedding, their laptops. They brought with them their hopes and their dreams for a brighter future. And it is this institution to which they're entrusting these, their most precious possessions. We are, and we must continue to be, an institution worthy of that trust. And we are an institution that's worthy of that trust because of the quality of the education we provide and the student experience. I continue to have reaffirmed to me every single day that the strength of UM is not simply in our excellence in any one discipline, but rather in the way in which we shape students and researchers able to work across multiple fields and solve problems at the intersection of disciplines. As you'll often hear me say, UM's greatest strength is in the and. And these aren't just pictures on a slide. These aren't just phrases. We're an evidence-based institution. And I see the evidence all around. I see the evidence in our students. We have just two of them pictured here. On the left, you see Joshua Teague Rutherford. He graduated with a biology degree and minors in global public health and Native American studies. A member of the Grovant tribe, Teague grew up on the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation and then in Billings. At UM, he blossomed as a leader, serving as vice president of GrizzMed, the college club for pre-med students. And now he has plans to become perhaps, perhaps the first dentist from his reservation. And Kim Paro, picture on the right here. I think Kim's here today. You know, after 26 years in the beauty industry, Kim enrolled in our psychology program. She was a non-traditional trio student, a mother, very little savings, but she surprised herself. She received two scholarships and a fellowship, and she graduated with a GPA of 
It's... And even more impressive, she today, with the encouraging support of her UM mentors, Kim is now a licensed clinical professional, professional counselor, and she's finishing her PhD in our counselor ed program while still working as a grief specialist at the Tamarack Grief Resource Center. And she's having a positive in impact on, on this Missoula community. In Kim's words, what is happening to me now in my life is between me and the University of Montana, and I'm finally free. You've helped me to be seen and this means so much. It's wonderful to see this impact. And I also see the evidence in the quality of our programs and the sciences. Many of you know our wildlife biology program is number one in all of North America. And our biology majors here at the University of Montana get into med school at, nearly, at, a, at a percentage that is nearly 30 points higher than the national average. In the arts and humanities, you can see Andrew Sean Greer pictured here. We're incredibly proud that the, the newly named Pulitzer Prize winner is a UM alum. And he joins a host of other UM awardees. UM Arts boasts eight Emmy Award winners, an Oscar Award winner, Golden Globe winner, Bessie Award winner. The list goes on. And in our professional schools, our law school ranks seventh in judicial clerkship placements and 16th nationally in federal judicial clerkships, topping schools such as Columbia and NYU. Our schools in pharmacy and PT nationally renowned, as well as our College of Business. In fact, we just learned that our graduates' pass rate on the very difficult CPA exam over the past year, our graduates had the highest pass rate of any public university in the West. Number one. It, it's a pretty nice way to celebrate that college's centennial. So I, I could go on for half an hour about the quality of our, of our programs. But I also see the evidence in our research and creative scholarship. We had yet another yet record year of research this year, an award volume of $96.5 million. So congratulations to this community. And this research is making an impact across a wide range of disciplines. For example, UM's Rural Institute for Inclusive Communities recently earned a five-year, $4.3 million grant to support its research and training center on disability in rural communities. And Dr. Julie Walter, pictured here, I see her up here in the row, maybe feeling a little embarrassed, but Dr. Walter received a perfect score on her NIH grant and received a $4.5 million award to study language development and dyslexia in children. And we even see it. <laughs> and we even see the impact of UM scholarship in popular media. That is Anya Jabor, one of our region's professors. And that's not a student she's pictured with. That's an actor from the PBS series Mercy Street, on which Anya served as a historical advisor. And you talk about scholarship having an impact, that show reached more than 5 million viewers. And they have a more accurate, a more realistic, a more comprehensive view of our nation's history because of Anya and because of this university. <laughs> and we're also seeing evidence in the tangible team, excuse me, tangible progress that our teams are making even over the past few months. Many of you know that our summer enrollment was up 17% year over year, the highest it's been in recent years. And 463 students actually completed their graduation requirements over the summer, completed that degree, and are moving to the next phase of their life. And you may recall we launched Project Simplification earlier this year to look at all of our operations to ensure that we're as efficient as possible so that we can dedicate our resources to the core activities of teaching, research, and student development. And we're already seeing significant progress. I want to cite just three examples among many. On our recent efforts around sustainability and efficiency have resulted in close to $300,000 in annual savings on utilities. And earlier this year, we entered into an agreement with a local business to run printing services on campus. This is an area which had generated significant financial losses 
over the year, over the past few years. We're now in the second month of that operating agreement, and we're already generating positive revenue for the, for the university while delivering the same or even enhanced levels of service. And finally, our effort to streamline and, and, and enhance and improve our processes are showing uh, real promise. Our, our team's plan to revamp our travel procedures is estimated to generate more than $100,000 of savings. We have a slight error on the slide. It should say 100, not 300, although maybe I'll give them that as a target. Um, <laughs> Rosie is uh, out this week, so she's going to be very upset to see that that slide says 300 instead of 100. But uh, it, as well as 4,700 hours of time. In our recruitment and hiring process, streamlining that, our team estimates we can save about $40,000 a year as well as about 1,400 hours. And I mention these efforts because they're critical. And they're critical because these are hours and dollars that we can dedicate to our core mission of teaching, research, and student development. So this evidence shows me that we have what we need. Creative, smart people, supporters all over the world, students who push us to do better. But we have to adapt, and that's not easy. The simple fact is that in some areas, we haven't done what we need to do. We as an institution have not done a good enough job telling the story of the great work that's happening here at UM and making it easy for students to come and remain at the university. We shouldn't hide from that hard truth. As Herman Melville once wrote, failure is the true test of greatness. So when we have failures, we must acknowledge them and address them. You know, our enrollment will be down slightly this fall, but it's actually much better than we projected it would be back in February. And that's through the hard work of many of you listening today, and I can tell you that I'm more confident than ever that as we communicate more effectively and put in place the right operational processes, our enrollment will grow. We have people all over the country who want to attend UM. We just need to be visible to them, and we need to give them a clear and helpful pathway to campus. I had it reaffirmed to me on the way over here, actually. I ran into some parents of, an, of a new freshman from Utah, and I had asked for their feedback. I said, please email me, please call me, and this uh, incredibly passionate woman yelled, yelled from across the, uh, across the street and ran over and said, I can't tell you how happy we are to be here. I can't tell you how great everyone has been. I can't tell you how just excited I am for my son. But I can't tell you how hard it was to actually get here. You know, it, it, was, it was confusing. The processes were unclear. We didn't hear enough. We, and, and we have to do better there. And we will. And the good news is when we do, when we show people the incredible quality of this institution and the incredible quality of the people here, we will have uh, a lot of students showing up here and, and benefiting from this tremendous institution. Thanks. Now, we must acknowledge that the work ahead of us will at times be difficult. We will make hard choices around faculty resources and how we will allocate them to most effectively meet the needs of our students. We're using a method vetted by ECOS and the UPC, and the chairs and deans are now looking at staffing levels through a strategic lens. While I know we will face some painful decisions, we will not defer these decisions. As I said in January, we cannot design UM for drift. Strategic choices are by their nature difficult, but we'll make these choices with an eye on our future, building toward a UM of enhanced distinction, a UM that is imaginative, creative, data-informed, and strategic, mirroring what a liberal arts education prepares our students to do. So how do we get there? The good news is we've been pretty consistent in identifying what we value and what we want to achieve. I spent a good chunk of time over the summer reviewing our past strategic planning documents, the UM 2020 plan, the strategic vision, our accreditation reports, and in these documents, you see the same values and principles emerge again and again. We have these right. 
And earlier this year, the UPC did a great job building upon these documents and distilling our mission and the ways in which we can distinguish ourselves as a university. The task now is to implement our good ideas. We as an institution must be clear, not just in our values and principles, but also in the concrete steps we will take to live up to them. So as we begin this academic year, we're not engaging in a new strategic planning process or working through our collective vision. We know what we want to do. It's time now to roll up our sleeves and focus on making steady progress. So together with our leadership team, I'm focused on five key priorities for action that represent those things we can control. And I, and I would ask each of you to focus on these priorities every day in your role. I want to speak a little bit about each of them. Number one, place student success at the center of all that we do. In all of our decisions and actions, we will put the success of our students first. We will renew our intense focus on student retention, persistence, and success through graduation and beyond. As I announced back in March, we're integrating student and academic affairs to place a deliberate and holistic focus on the student experience. With Dr. Harbour's arrival, we're beginning a search for a vice provost for student success to lead this newly integrated area. The vice provost will sit on cabinet, ensuring that we all put our students' success first. But this is about more than just structure and process. This is about becoming a model institution for effective and comprehensive support and success of our students. It's our number one priority. Number two, drive excellence and innovation in teaching, learning, and research. This is at the core of what we do as an institution. And we owe it to ourselves, our students, and the public to ensure that our curriculum and our pedagogy continue to evolve and adapt to best prepare our students for dynamic, uncertain world. And that the communities of excellence that were articulated by the UPC begin to come to life as interdisciplinary learning and research communities. Number three, embody the principle of mission first, people always. You've heard it stated in forums like this in the past that 90% of our budget is personnel. And I share that stat again today, not as a rationale for a budgeting decision. I share that stat again today because it is evidence of the absolutely fundamental role of people in making this institution successful. While the word institution is used a lot, and it evokes images of buildings and grounds, the reality is that our people are this institution. And our campus community has identified the need for a cabinet level position that focuses on our people's growth and learning, and specifically on the fostering of a diverse and inclusive campus. I take seriously and agree with this need. And as we begin this semester, I look forward to working with our community to finalize what that position looks like and ensure that we have a diverse, supportive, and inclusive community in which all of our team members can reach their full potential. Number four, partner with place. Our students in this entire community benefit tremendously from the ways in which we partner with the city of Missoula and the entire state of Montana to deliver educational outcomes and positive impacts on our community. And I'm proud of all that we have done, and I will actively encourage continued and enhanced engagement in our community and in the surrounding region. This is success that we are going to build upon. Number five, proudly tell the UM story. As I've said in the past, we are an institution the world needs to know about. It was nice to see the world learning a little bit about this institution this past weekend with three of our graduates highlighted on national TV. We need to continue that, not just to bring new students here, but also to ensure that people understand the incredible work that happens every day on this campus and the transformative impact that UM has on its students. The restructure we announced back in March also brought together our enrollment and our communications functions. And I'm very, very excited to have Kathy Cole on board leading this efforts, these efforts. Those of you who haven't had a chance to meet her, uh, 
you're, you're in for a treat when you do. She is terrific, she is passionate, and she's hardworking. And we couldn't be more lucky to have her with us. So we're not going to be arrogant about it. But we're going to be forceful. And we're going to be persistent in proudly telling UM's story. The story that you're writing every day. These are the priorities around which we will organize our efforts this year, and we'll get this right. So I'm calling upon all of us to respond to these priorities for actions, for action, excuse me. Change now will be in the doing, not just in the thinking about what we should do. And these efforts require the collective capacity of our faculty, our staff, and our students. And so I want to introduce three of our colleagues next. They're, our, they're, they're my partners in this shared work. ASUM Vice President Mariah Welch, Faculty Senate Chair Matt Semenoff, and Staff Senate Chair Luke Alford. They represent the why, the how, and the who of our work. Our students and their potential for growth and for transforming their worlds are the why. We, the UM family, are the how and the who. And with that, I would like you to please join me in welcoming Mariah. Good afternoon, everyone, or as students who have been sleeping in all morning and all summer would like to say, good morning. <laughs> Throughout the summer, I have had the opportunity to see our campus from a new perspective, one that leaves me amazed at what students achieve each and every day. I spent the summer working in Washington, D.C., and coming back made me realize not just the beauty of the place that we call home, but really the people who live here. Every single time I talk to a student about their passion for campus, I'm reminded more of what makes the University of Montana so special. Students like Shane St. Ange. This summer, I had the pleasure of learning more about Shane and his deep ties with the University of Montana. Shane completed his undergraduate degree with high honors in political science and went on to complete a master's degree in public administration. Before he returns to campus in the fall to attend Alexander Blewett III Law School, he spent the summer working as a Bacchus Fellow in the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. Shane came to the university because it was a family tradition to do so, but he remained a Grizz because of people on our campus, such as Dr. Sarah Rinfrey, that inspired and encouraged him to do more. While it's faculty and staff that help students achieve their dreams once they are on campus, it's often students' stories of successes that bring others to our university. Students like Kat Cowley. In May, she graduated with a degree in women's gender and sexuality studies. And over the summer, Kat has been working to help students facing homelessness and food insecurity, which is increasingly prevalent on college campuses and is often a barrier to student success and retention. She's working with people all around campus to establish a food pantry, all while starting her graduate degree in public administration this fall. Kat believes that the University of Montana is a place where people care for each other. She learned this through people like Jordan Lyons and Daisy Rooks, who are partnering with her and encouraging her to use her voice to better the lives of other students on our campus. Students are working to make our campus and our world a better place. But in order to achieve these things, they had mentors, they had advisors, and they had allies who helped and supported them along the way. I know that I have had my fair share of people who impacted my education. I was lucky enough to have a life-changing educator in eighth grade math. I remember going back to that year, and I had lost all self-confidence. I simply had no idea how to do math in an honors class. We all have those kinds of struggles, but for me, I was really concerned that I knew nothing. It really took my eighth grade math professor, Michael Qualls, to remind me of my worth, not just as a student, but as a person. This reminded me of the importance of having someone who believes in you. Each and every one of us can foster this kind of experience and it's our responsibility to do so on our campus. This year, the Associated Students of the University of Montana are working to create a more inclusive student experience. 
That's why we'll be including every kind of student possible into our conversations and our decisions by going out of our way to meet them where they are at. We believe it is important to focus on students from different backgrounds, races, disciplines, and so much more. ASUM will continue to make the most disenfranchised student engaged in our campus. We will be reaching out to students across all areas to include them in search committees and Senate processes to create a stronger student voice. And every action that we take this year will be with the student's best interest at heart. We recognize that our university has gone through some struggles in the past. We believe the best solution to these challenges is to make students a center of every process and every decision that takes place on our campus. That's why it's important that when we go forward this year, you focus on how you can better the lives of each and every student that calls this place home. Strive to be the faculty member who encourages the student to further their education here because we have some of the best programs in the nation. Strive to be the staff member who works to lift a student's voice up to cultivate a better campus community for everyone. Strive to make every day student driven and watch this campus flourish. Between now and May, you can change a student's life. Between now and May, you can be the person that reminds a student of their self-worth. So start today. Thank you. And now I, would, now I would like to welcome Matt Semenoff, Chair of Faculty Senate. Thank you, Mariah. One of the privileges of serving on campus committees and the executive committee of the Faculty Senate in particular has been the opportunity to work more closely with ASUM and to see our students' dedication. Mariah's words provide an important reminder of why we are here. It's for our students. Our work transforms their lives. We all help students develop the knowledge and skills to pursue their dreams and aspirations, and perhaps even the opportunity to transform the lives of, lives of others. Regardless of our positions, this is what we all share, a commitment to the transform transformative educational experience. My name is Matthew Semenoff, and I'm serving as the chair of Faculty Senate this year. Over the past several years, this campus has spent enormous time and energy identifying its strategic aims, defining its missions, and examining how it can best serve the students and the citizens of Montana. This period of self-examination will ultimately allow our campus to turn toward the actions that will empower our students to achieve their goals and to emerge as the ones who will later transform our world. As a classicist, I can't help but observe that this recent period of introspection parallels what can be described as the Socratic turn. This term has been used to describe Socrates' decision to set aside philosophic speculation about the external world for the pursuit of self-knowledge. Socrates models for us the courage to stand up and ask ourselves difficult questions, to demand cogent arguments, and to challenge ourselves to achieve something nobler. The figure of Socrates reminds us that the pursuit of self-knowledge requires not just individuals asking questions, but active engagement through dialogue. He reminds us that this academic endeavor often depends on exposing our own vulnerabilities. Yet it leads us to take personal and intellectual risks by acknowledging that others will be beneficiaries of those risks. For Socrates, those beneficiaries were the citizens of Athens. For us, those beneficiaries are the students arriving on campus this week. The university is currently engaged in a process that follows an extraordinarily rich academic tradition. Central to this is the pursuit of self-knowledge, which can only come to light through asking challenging questions and, frankly, demanding thoughtful responses. No attempt at serious introspection comes without its challenges. At the final Faculty Senate meeting last spring, we heard expressions of support for proposals for change, but also frustration and dissent from our partners in shared governance, from students, staff, and faculty alike. 
but we are making great progress in this endeavor. As faculty, we often emphasize the importance of critical thinking. We strive to achieve greater degrees of interdisciplinarity within our own work and our curricula. We do so because we recognize that the challenges we face today and the ones that we expect our students to be able to face require expertise from various disciplines and perspectives. This is the strength of the UM education, the preparation to respond to great challenges with careful, deliberate analysis and consideration of diverse perspectives. Such analysis provides the foundation for the next steps, and so our challenge now becomes to act on what we have learned. As we continue to engage in our pursuit of institutional self-knowledge, as we set the course for the next period of the University of Montana's history, as the discussion fades and the actions arise, we ourselves model the strength of the liberal arts education to which so many of us have expressed our commitment. We need to acknowledge the fact that asking questions as well as challenging the responses to those questions is what we do as faculty every day in our own work, in our disciplines, and it is arguably the most important outcome of our students' education here. And we need to acknowledge that for UM to transform lives, we all must be committed to introspection and informed action alike. We value diversity of opinions and perspectives in shaping our path to the future. And so I look forward to working with a renewed spirit of collaboration, both among the faculty and across the entire campus. Thank you. And now I am pleased to hand things over to the Chair of Staff Senate, Luke Alford. Uh, Luke. Luke's a proud alumnus of the University of Montana who graduated and now works with the Department of Youth, uh, Health and Human Performance. Thank you. Okay. That could have been bad. I don't know where you began. Is that there you? we go. Matt was going to run off with my, my script. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank the President for the opportunity to speak today. His invitation to shared governance demonstrates a commitment to communicate and team build with the people who hold the health and well-being of the university closest. I am honored to be here with you in this moment when there's so much opportunity to shape our institution's future. And I'm honored to represent staff at the University of Montana. It's a big job representing staff Staff is the largest and most professionally diverse body on campus. We're advisors and accountants, lab techs and landscapers. We're sign language interpreters. We connect campus. We keep campus safe. Our job is really to help you do your job better. Our job is to help unlock student success. And on the long list of selfless, mission-driven people working at the university, Staff is right at the top. Listening to the President speak, I heard his call to embody the principle of mission first, people always. I perked right up at those words. He's been saying them since the day he stepped on campus, and I'm excited we have a leader with the imperative to value human capital. I believe a place is little more than the quality of the people in it. I'm convinced this is the reason why the University of Montana in Missoula is such an amazing place to be. It's the people, the faculty, the staff, the administrators, contract professionals, adjuncts, um, lecturers, everyone here, especially the students. We all play a unique and special role, and we all pick up the mission each day and actively make the University of Montana the best place for students to learn, imagine, and grow. But the university can't only be the best place for students. The university must strive to be the best place in Montana to go to work. To be the best, it's necessary for the university to develop professional training that enables its people to better perform their work.
To be the best, it's necessary to have opportunity for professional development. In order to retain our high caliber, student-centered workforce, we must have long-range goals for growth, job pathways that reward performance, and methods for acknowledging when a job is well done. With that, I couldn't be more pleased to hear our president begin planning for a cabinet level position that focuses on the growth and learning of campus citizens. The creation of this position displays fidelity to the mission first, people always principle. It's a bold principle because embedded in it are with, because, excuse me, because embedded within it are underwritten obligations. First, the principal exerts an obligation on the institution to invest in its people. I'm not just talking about an investment of money. Investing in people also me means creating a culture, a culture in which it's safe for someone to be vulnerable and ask for the training they need. It means setting expectations high and giving people the skills to be successful. Second, the principal confers on us an obligation for action. We have to succeed because this is our university. And if it is not us succeeding, then who here will, will succeed? Each person is charged with finding ways to activate the best in themselves. By realizing our full potential, we in turn elevate our ability to serve students and build a momentum that carries on the legacy of greatness that is the University of Montana. And finally, the principal charges everyone to work cooperatively and support each other in the name of student success. I think we do this pretty well. The Missoula community, I think, does this pretty well. In the lead up to today's address, I was asked quite a few times if I was nervous. And yes, I mean, of course. Uh, but the more I thought about it and the more I developed my remarks, the more it occurred to me uh, that this is a room full of my allies. I feel support and I feel connected to that support. And it's because I recognize that we each choose to spend the precious moments of our lives here, together, responding to the same call. We all must recognize that we're partners and teammates working towards the same mission, to transform lives by providing a high quality and accessible education. As a campus and broader community, we must embody the principle of mission first, people always. It's critical. We must do this work wholeheartedly and in earnest, but most importantly, we must do it together. From the top down, to alumni, to community partners, we have a chance right now to answer the call and stand side by side and make this moment in UM's history our own. Thank you, everyone. You want to hit that? There you go. <laughs> Just seeing if you all are watching the slides. So it is an honor to work with those three leaders. I am so grateful to be your partners in this important work and uh, thankful for your commitment to this university and, uh, and everyone that's a part of this community. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to take a brief moment to just introduce some of the other new leaders at the, at the AO, the academic officer, and cabinet level who have stepped up and stepped in to serve our campus over the past six months. You know, I'm committed to leading a team that is worthy of each of you and of our students. And so I have been and will continue to be deliberate in choosing campus leaders upon whom I will rely and who are here to serve you. And the individuals pictured here uh, have recently joined the team. They are all deeply committed to this mission, and it is an honor to work with them. I want to start by just acknowledging some of our new leaders at the AO level. Uh, Katie Cordingly, who is the Interim Director of the Davidson Honors College, as well as uh, Jenny McNulty, who is serving as Dean of the College of Humanities and Sciences. They both have stepped into these roles and are doing a fantastic job already. I want to, of course, thank uh, Dean Brock Tessman and Dean Chris Comer for their service and their important roles. You know, he had a nice send-off for Brock before he headed off to, uh, to Ochi. 
And uh, we'll soon be having a gathering to thank Chris for his more than a decade of service as dean of our largest college. So we're excited for these new leaders and grateful for their predecessors for their service. And at the cabinet level, I want to recognize a, a few individuals. Amy Capalupo, who has stepped in with just a great passion and fire for our students as the uh, acting director of student affairs, as well as Kathy Cole, who I mentioned earlier, is uh, on board now for just over a month as the vice president for enrollment management and strategic communications, as well as Renee Scott, who recently stepped in uh, as our CIO. We want to uh, congratulate Matt Riley on his uh, new and exciting uh, adventure over in the land of the ducks. He's going to join the uh, University of Oregon and an exciting new role and we're so excited to have uh, Renee stepping in to, uh, to lead uh, our IT team. I also want to thank uh, Kelly Webster you know, who, who came on board as uh, our chief of staff and is just having a tremendous impact and of course uh, welcome uh, John Harbour, our executive vice president and provost. You know, I have to, with this community, though, also thank Paul Kurgis, who stepped in in a massive way uh, for this university. I can't thank him enough. Uh, we all owe him a tremendous debt of gratitude for the work he's done and, and for what he's continuing to do. Uh, he was a steady hand as an interim provost and has been a, a great mentor and partner for both me and for John as he's come on board. Uh, and I know that there are many others who are stepping in and, and stepping up across this university. And I want to offer my sincere thanks to all of those leaders for the passion, the commitment uh, that they are showing in, in support and service of this community. And now, it is my pleasure to turn the podium over to our new provost, uh, Dr. John Harbour. Those of, well, we're not, I'm not done yet. One more. You're like, get off there, buddy. No. But those of you, just briefly, those of you who've met Dr. Harbour, uh, or those of you who've, had, who've read his CV, actually, uh, you'll see that he's an accomplished scholar, a teacher, an academic administrator. But those of you who have had the chance to meet him, you also see that he is a terrific leader and just simply a wonderful human being. Uh, we are so honored to have him here. He is now uh, about three weeks into the job, and uh, we are very excited to have him here. And I'd like to welcome our executive vice president and provost, Dr. John Harbour. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for welcoming me into this community. I am thrilled to be here and honored to be here at the University of Montana. Here on Salish Aboriginal territory, where the Salish camped, dug bitterroot, and fished for bull trout, a place long known for its abundant resources. Here on the site of a university that has celebrated 125 years of excellence, a, unity, a university that transforms lives and communities. Here on the site of a university at a critical juncture in its history, a point where intentional change is an imperative. One of the most fundamental contributions of a university is its transformative impact. UM, UM transforms student lives and the communities and families that they are connected with. UM transforms faculty and staff, providing an environment in which they can achieve their potential. And UM transforms our communities, communities that are enriched and improved through education, through new ways of doing and thinking, and through the economic impact, community health, and innovation that comes with an educated community. Why does this resonate so much with me? I grew up in a large family of limited means, and though my parents had not gone to university, my mother was very focused on her children getting educated as a pathway to a better life. State grants and scholarships opened the doors to college for me, and my time at university was stunningly transformative. It led to experiences I never dreamed were possible. Before I went to college, I had not ever been on an aeroplane, yet at the end of my second year I found myself on a flight to India, leading a group of six undergraduates on a research expedition to the Himalayas. 
My college education also launched my life and career. I deeply appreciate and enjoy the opportunities I have had to serve as a faculty member, to advance basic and applied research in science and education, working with amazing interdisciplinary teams of students and colleagues, to inspire students and provide them with transformational experiences, and to remain connected to them as their careers develop, to work with communities near and far in ways that have helped address their needs to balance sustainability, resilience, and economic activity. My experience is just one of many examples of the impact of a college education. The work we do provides an individual good, my life was transformed, but also a public good. I am now committed to transforming the world around me. The President has outlined a series of key priorities for action, the first of which is to place student success at the centre of all we do. So what is success for a student? Successful students stay in school, persist through to timely graduation, and have a range of highly engaging experiences that support their intellectual, emotional, social, ethical, and physical development. Successful students go on to have healthy, fulfilling lives, including good jobs, and succeeding at the educational, personal, community, and occupational activities for which their college experiences prepared them. In line with national priorities, Montana has set a goal that 60% of adults will have a post-secondary degree or credential by 2025. And the governor has just created a future-ready cabinet to focus efforts on this goal. To achieve this will require very significant improvements in student success. I interpret this challenge as our obligation, and I know it is one that we can fulfill together. Holistic and integrated student success is a key priority for action for the University of Montana, which is one of the reasons that I have reformulated a vacant position in my office to allow us to search for a vice provost for student success. Our priorities this year in student success will also be to move towards providing incoming students with the resources and coursework that they need to be college ready. Providing every student with both a dedicated, trained, professional academic advisor and a faculty mentor. Ensuring that all students participate in high impact educational practices, such as first year seminars, learning communities, collaborative projects, writing intensive courses, global and community-based learning, internships, undergraduate research, and capstone projects. And expanding and making explicit the connections and linkages between students' academic interests and the other key parts of their student experience. Taking these steps will result in substantial and measurable increases in student success in the next few years. Improved persistence to graduation will contribute to larger enrollments at UM that, in turn, will provide tuition revenue and performance-based funding to sustain a transformed student model. Student success is also about making sure that we are matching our current resources to our needs. This is why this semester, after input from many of you, we are engaging every academic unit in planning for its future instructional staffing. We must be conscientious and strategic about supporting our students' key needs, as well as investing in our other priorities. We have the capacity and determination to work together to get this done. As a faculty member, and also Chief Academic Officer of the University, my vision for UM's academic affairs includes focusing on teaching and learning as a critical component for achieving our goals for student success. Like many of you, I have spent time at several different institutions, 
and now I've seen the varied levels of commitment there are to the educational mission. I am certain that UM can be a model for teaching and learning at a public research university. Those of you who know my background will not be surprised to hear that I'm very interested in seeing how I can help catalyze innovation and excellence in the ways that we help our students learn. And the phrasing there is intentional. The emphasis is on student learning, the outcomes. It is amazing how much we have learned about highly effective ways to facilitate student learning compared to what I knew when I started teaching. Back in the days of mimeograph machines, overhead projectors, and slide trays. We now live in a world of active learning, experiential learning, social learning, online learning, flipped classrooms, and a focus, focus on backwards design. My approach will include encouraging adaptation and implementation of what is learned from action research and from the scholarship of teaching and learning. It is clear that there are some very strong initiatives in this area already at UM. And I had the pleasure of visiting two different faculty workshops in this area this summer. But now is the time to transform this from an activity for a small group of faculty who happen to be extremely interested in teaching to a culture and set of activities that define our faculty community. We plan to expand opportunities for faculty to learn about new approaches and ways to adapt their pedagogy. And later this year, my office will sponsor a campus-wide event centered on the scholarship of teaching and learning to spark a campus-wide conversation. I will also invite collaboration to explore how we can build the scholarship of teaching and learning more clearly into unit standards and other incentive systems consistent with our established processes. My priorities for action also include developing new ways of reaching students when and where they are. So what does that mean? It means working to expand online opportunities for students who are here in Missoula, as well as the far greater number of potential students who are not in a position to relocate to Missoula. It means asking what mix of class times and days during the week and the weekend provide the greatest access for our students. It means expanding summer opportunities, both for our current and future degree-seeking students, as well as for learners across the US and around the world who could take a summer course or program at UM. As a newcomer to this community, I can see many signs that UM is on the rise. Extensive, engaged planning over the past few years has led to specific priorities for action that will drive what we do, that will drive our rise. As a community, we have looked hard at where we are, recommended how to move forward, and now we will be moving specific steps through our governance processes to make this happen. We are going to implement change as a community. It will be hard, but together we are going to rise. How will we know we are on the rise? UM is taking clear steps to be a data-informed university where we explicitly use quantitative and qualitative data to drive what we do and assess the effectiveness of our efforts so that we can change or improve what is not achieving what we need. Our recent summer session growth is just one sign that we have great potential to rise. More students making progress and graduating sooner. More use of our facilities and people. And one way in which we are moving towards a more sustainable financial model that rewards innovation. Other signs that we are on the rise include the fact that our students are graduating with lower debt. And despite a very challenging funding environment, we have a record level of research funding. As a scientist, I'm compelled to ask what other evidence there is that UM is on the rise. 
And my colleague, Professor Bendick, shared me with the work of her graduate student, Ellen Knapp, that shows that UM is very literally on the rise this month. GPS measurements show that the valley and surrounding peaks here are displaced up and down annually due to the loading and unloading of the Earth's surface by the mountain snowpack. So today, we are literally and physically on the rise. Sorry, I'm a geoscientist nerd, so, you know. <laughs> I am often asked what my priorities are. What do I believe is most important? My conversations with many faculty and staff have led me to conclude that, at UM, we believe in student success at the center of all that we do. We believe in helping academic communities connect across the traditional silos to create a collaborative web of activity that excites, inspires, and improves outcomes. We believe in fairness and transparency in all that we do, in creating access and success for all, in celebrating diversity and building an inclusive community that is enriched by its diversity, in making particular efforts to enhance success for those whose needs we have not met well in the past. We believe in reaching out to communities that we serve and talking with elected officials, elders, business leaders, and community groups to find out how we can be strengthening and altering our programs to meet the changing needs and opportunities of those who we serve. UM is on the rise, and I'm convinced that as a community, we have the strength and quality to sustain that rise. This is critically important because at the University of Montana, we transform lives. Thank you. I'm now going to ask our deans to come to the stage to introduce our new and newly promoted faculty. Please hold your applause until the group from each college or school has been introduced. First, Paul Kurgis, Dean of the Blewett School of Law. Thank you, Provost Harbor. I'm Paul Kurgis. I am the Dean of the Blewett School of Law, and it is my great pleasure to welcome two new faculty to UM and to the School of Law. Professor Craig Cowie, and Professor Sandra Zelmer. Next, I would like to recognize our faculty who have received promotions this year. Uh, our professors John Byington and Sam Panarella were promoted to full professor with tenure. Professor Sandra Zelmer comes to us uh, as a newly tenured professor, and our professors Monty Mills and Cathay Smith were promoted from assistant to associate professor. Congratulations. And now I'll welcome Dean Chris Shook of the College of Business. It is my pleasure to congratulate two professors. Justin Engel, who was awarded tenure this year, and Jason Trish, who is promoted to associate professor. And now I welcome to the podium Reed Humphreys, Dean of the College of Health Professions and Biomedical Sciences. Thank you, Chris. Uh, in the College of Health Professions and Biomedical Sciences, I'd like to introduce to us, uh, to you, uh, three new faculty members. Uh, first, uh, Sophia Newcomer uh, in the School of Public and Community Health Sciences. Jen Malloy joins us at, in the School of Social Work. Uh, and uh, Stacy Hemmer uh, is, uh, joins us in the Skag School of Pharmacy. Uh, at this time, I'd also like to recognize from the college uh, 
uh, two professors uh, who have achieved uh, tenure and uh, or, or promotion. Uh, you, Dr. Yoon Hee Cho was uh, awarded tenure this year as an associate professor, and uh, Dr. Keith Anderson uh, was promoted to associate uh, promoted full professor in, uh, in the School of Social Work. So join me in congratulating them and welcoming new faculty. Thank you, and it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jenny McNulty, Dean of the College of Humanities and Sciences. Jenny? Thanks, Reed. We have quite a few faculty in the College of Humanities and Sciences to recognize today. First, our new faculty. It's my pleasure to welcome to HNS Doug Brinkenhoff in the Department of Computer Science and Adam Brewer in the Masters of Public Administration in the Department of Political Science. Next is my pleasure to congratulate those faculty that have received promotions and or tenure this year. First, those that have received tenure and promotion to associate professor are Orion Berryman, Abhichek Chatterjee, Brian Dowdle, Matt Roscoe, and Ekaterina Voronina. Next, on to those that have received tenure. David Gates, Paul Jansen, David Macaluso, Bob Hall, and someone who's missing from our slide, and we apologize. You did get tenure. <laughs> Michihiro Ama. And to those that have been promoted to associate professor, Robert Smith and Matt Taylor. And last but not least, those group of faculty that were promoted to full professor, Duncan Campbell, Daniel Dennis, Swazig Lebian, Helen Naughton, Brett Tobolsky, Andrew Wilcox, Art Woods, and Christina Yoshimura. Let's give these faculty a large round of applause. It's my pleasure to introduce Stephen Kahn, Dean of the College of Visual and Performing Arts. Thank you, Jenny. I'd like to welcome the new faculty in my college, uh, Michael Rubelid uh, from the School of Music, and Michael Legg from the School of Theater and Dance. It's also my pleasure to congratulate those faculty members who are receiving promotion and tenure this year. Jennifer Combe, tenure and promotion to associate professor, Pamela Steele, promotion to associate professor, and Jennifer Cavanaugh and Kevin Griggs, promotion to full professor. Please join me in recognizing these faculty. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Barry Brown of the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Library. Good morning. I have the privilege of representing Dean Shali Zhang today, who's currently in Malaysia. And I have the pleasure of congratulating Wendy Walker, who was promoted to associate professor. Please join me in congratulating her. <laughs> Next up is Roger McLean, Dean of Missoula College. Good morning. I'm very pleased to welcome a new faculty member uh, to the faculty at Missoula College, Catherine Geiger, Department of Health Professions. And next, it's my pleasure to congratulate faculty who've received tenure and promotion this year. First, we have Zach Reddick, Reddick tenure and promotion to associate professor. And then Michelle Bowler, Allison Pepper, and Steve Shen all received tenure. Please join me in recognizing these faculty and welcome to our new faculty member.
And next, it's my pleasure to introduce Adria Lawrence, Dean of the Phyllis J. Washington College of Education and Human Sciences. Thank you. I would like to welcome Ashley Moe, our new faculty member in the Department of Communicative Sciences and Disorders. I would also like to congratulate faculty who have received tenure and or promotion. We have Kathy Off and Julie Wolter who received tenure, Dan Lee and Lori Slovarp who were promoted to associate professor, and Francie O'Reilly who was promoted to full professor. Please join me in recognizing them with a round of applause. I'd now like to introduce Larry Abramson, Dean of the School of Journalism. Thank you, Adria. In the School of Journalism, we have much to celebrate. The amazing Jewel Banville has received tenure. Uh, the wonderful Joe Eaton has received a promotion to associate professor, and the prolific and gifted Lee Banville and Keith Graham have both been promoted to full professor. Let's give them a hand. Now let's turn to Tom DeLuca. He's the Dean of the College, the A.W. Frankie College of Forestry and Conservation. Thank you, Larry. It's my pleasure to congratulate faculty who have received tenure and promotion in the W.A. Frankie College of Forestry and Conservation. Vicki Dreitz, Kelsey Genso, Phil Higuera and Scott Mills received tenure. Andrew Whiteley was promoted to associate professor, and Solomon Dabrowski, Lisa Eby, and Kara Nelson were all promoted to full professor. Congratulations. Wow, that is uh, one of the best times of year to see the new and exciting and incredibly talented people who are joining this university and those who their tremendous work are receiving well-deserved accolades and promotions. So it is, a, it is a wonderful way to conclude this, uh, this ceremony. You know, as I stated at, this, at the outset of this morning, this university is not one person. It's all of you. You in this room, you who are watching, you who are currently with students, or perform, performing the work that is essential to our distinction. And I encourage you to look at what you've created. Be proud of it and be proud of what we're going to do together. Are we capable? Yes. Is the difficult ahead, is, excuse me, is the difficult work ahead worth it? Yes. So let's not tinker at the edges. Let's build a UM that boldly marries access and quality to transform lives and communities. We won't look the same moving forward. We will be a different, we will be a stronger, more vibrant institution. We have a great foundation to build on and I am so excited to see how this community builds an even further excellence and distinction for this university. And it is my great honor to be your partner in this incredibly important work. So thank you for joining today, everyone. Thanks for everything you're doing. And here's to the great start of an academic year. Have a wonderful day.